Last class we introduced the idea of internal combustion engines as well as some terminology related to these types of heat engines. We talked about pistons and cylinders and things like bottom dead center and top dead center, mean effective pressure. We talked about spark ignition engines and compression ignition engines and today we're going to shift our focus to talk a little bit more about a particular type of internal combustion engine called the auto cycle. And we're going to learn how to do an analysis of that type of internal combustion engine. Remember, when we looked at internal combustion engines, we kind of made the realization that an actual internal combustion engine is really, really hard to analyze, especially if you're trying to do it analytically. The cycle is not adiabatic. The working fluid isn't just air. It's some mixture of air and fuel you're combusting that fuel inside the air so there's a chemical reaction happening that's generating heat you have kinetic energy that might be important as these pistons move up and down in the cylinders you have transient changes in the system things like pressure and temperature are changing with time and this system is sometimes open when exhaust or intake valves are open and sometimes closed when both of those valves are closed so we looked at this and we said, well, you know, this is pretty difficult to do. I'd like to get some kind of a model for these types of engines that I can do with a pencil and a piece of paper. So as engineers, what we've learned to do is make assumptions about the universe. But we know that when we're doing that, we're no longer saying how the universe works. Instead, we're making a model and our model isn't reality. But we can take the findings from our model and transfer them into the real world to try to understand how to make things work better. In particular, when we're doing analytical solutions of internal combustion engines, we'll often use an air standard analysis. Assumptions that we make there include neglecting combustion and replacing it with only heat transfer in and out of the system. We'll assume that the system is always closed so we'll use the closed version of the first law where we have a delta u term and no h terms we'll assume that all the processes are reversible or ideal so that entropy generation term is always zero we'll assume that the working fluid is actually just air and we'll assume that air is an ideal gas so we'll neglect the fact that the real working fluid is some air fuel mixture and that it changes as we burn our fuel We'll also sometimes assume that specific heat is constant. Now, when we do that, we'll call this a cold air standard and we'll replace some equations in our solution with equations that have CP, CV, or K, which is the ratio of CP to CV. Now, we have to remember that when we do this, the math we're getting isn't going to give us the quote unquote correct answer. Instead, our model is going to give us some tools to understand qualitatively how we can improve performance, whether that's increasing the power that's developed in our engine or improving the efficiency or gas mileage of our internal combustion engine. Because we're using the closed system assumption, we're going to assume that for all the processes that happen in our internal combustion engine, we can use the closed system energy balance or the closed version of the first law. We'll also normally assume that each one of these processes are simple processes where we either have heat transfer or work, but don't generally have both. So how do I find work and heat in these internal combustion engines? So I neglect either heat transfer or work. And then I find that if I'm trying to find heat transfer, I get U at the end of my process minus U at the beginning of my process. But if I'm trying to find the power or the work, I'll assume the process is adiabatic, meaning that it's perfectly insulated. And then my work term becomes U at the beginning of my process minus U at the end of my process. Then I've got to ask myself, what's the fluid? And for these internal combustion engines, the working fluid we'll assume is an ideal gas, typically air. 
So for the ideal gases, we can use the ideal gas law, namely that PV is equal to MRT. Or if we want to divide both sides by the mass, we get that PV is equal to RT. Remember that in order to use mass in kilograms or pound mass, the sacrifice we make is that instead of using the universal gas constant, R bar, we have to use the specific gas constant, which is R bar divided by the molar mass. Sometimes we'll use the ideal gas law to move in between states. Now with the assumptions that we're making, we know that the mass stays constant because we assume the system is closed. We also know that the specific gas constant stays constant because here we're assuming that no chemical reaction takes place and the working fluid always remains the same ideal gas. So if that's true, then I know that P1, V1 over T1 should be equal to P2, V2 over T2 if I can make those assumptions. Typically, when we're doing these cycle analysis problems, we'll use the ideal gas law more than once. So we'll try to be finding the temperature at all these different states. Because if I'm trying to find delta U and the specific heat is constant, then I know that delta U is CV times delta T. So then when I assume variable specific heat, I'll also want to find the temperature because the temperature will help me look up the specific internal energy on table A22 in my textbook, provided my working fluid is air. How else do we find temperature? So sometimes when we're finding temperature, we need to make the assumption either that we have a variable specific heat or a constant specific heat, right? After all, when we ask the question, what's the fluid? It's always a two part question. If it's water or something like it, I'll first say that it's water and then I have to ask what's the phase. But if it's an ideal gas, first I say that it's an ideal gas, then I have to say, am I going to assume that specific heat changes with temperature? Or is it constant with temperature? If variable specific heat, then I know that delta U is just going to be delta U. And I'll find that specific internal energy on a table like table A22 in the textbook. This is a function of temperature and some other things that we'll see as we move through the problem. If it's constant specific heat, I'll never find the individual specific internal energies. Instead, I'll model that delta U term as CV times delta T. I'll also look for particular processes that are isentropic. Remember, as we move through this cycle, we will assume that every process is ideal with zero entropy generation. So if my process is also adiabatic, then I'll have an isentropic process. So this happens when I'm only putting work into the system in compression, or I'm getting work out of the system in a power stroke. So if I have variable specific heat, I'll look on my equation sheet for the class, and I'll see that variable specific heat for isentropic processes, I can use this equation. So when I'm using ideal gases, for internal combustion engines, what I want to look for is the ratio of volumes, because often I'll know the compression ratio in these cycles. Here, in the isentropic case, the ratio of the reduced volumes is equal to the ratio of the specific volumes, which is also the ratio of the actual volumes because the mass is always constant in these internal combustion engines. If I'm using a constant specific heat analysis and I have an isentropic process, then I'm going to look for an equation that has K in the exponent. And because I'll typically know the volume ratio, then I'll look for an equation with K in the exponent that talks about a volume ratio and not a pressure ratio. So these are different ways that I can find the change in the specific internal energy and the temperature or the internal energy at the exit of an isentropic process. Today we're going to go from this general discussion of internal combustion engines to a specific discussion about the auto cycle, which is a particular type of internal combustion engine cycle. So in the auto cycle, we have four internally reversible processes that go together in series. Now one of the differences between these internal combustion engines and say a Rankine cycle is that in a Rankine cycle, these different processes happen in different locations in my cycle. 
But in this internal combustion engine, all four of these processes will happen in the same piston cylinder assembly. It's just now, instead of changing position, we're changing time. So we'll run a different one of these cycles at different times. And to do the whole cycle, we have to go through all four of these cycles or all four of these processes within a particular piston cylinder assembly. So my first process is as I move from process one to two, I have an isentropic compression. So here we're thinking if we have inside of our cylinder or our piston cylinder assembly, we have clean air and the piston now is moving up with both valves closed to compress the fluid. So now we move from state one to state two and we get this isentropic compression. So here we're doing work in the system because there's no heat transfer. The second law would tell us that this is isentropic, that S1 is equal to S2. Now here we can draw this on a PV diagram with our volume getting smaller and our pressure getting bigger, but we can also draw this on a TS diagram so that we have a vertical process from one to two because S remains constant. Our second process is in an, I, in an auto cycle, and this is what distinguishes an auto cycle from different kinds of cycles that we'll talk about with internal combustion engines, is that we assume that as we add heat, we do so at constant volume. So we'll assume that the volume is constant. So notice on our PV diagram, as we move from state two to state three over here, we have this vertical line, right? This constant volume heat addition. On our TS diagram, our temperature is increasing as we add heat and our entropy, or our specific entropy, is also increasing. Now we have the isentropic expansion. This is equivalent to that gas, which has, in real life, had fuel that's burning inside the gas, so it expands as it heats up. This is our power stroke. So as we do this isentropic expansion, our system is now increasing in volume as the piston's moving down, and we're producing power. Notice on our TS diagram that this again is an isentropic process as we move from state three down to state four. Finally, we have to get back to our beginning state. And in this case, for this air standard auto cycle, we'll assume that we have constant volume heat rejection from the air in our system to the environment. So here we move from state four to state one and on our PV diagram, we assume that this happens at constant volume. So this is what an air standard auto cycle looks like. Here, there's only two volumes in our whole cycle. So we have a large volume. We could think about this maybe as when the piston is at bottom dead center and a small volume when the piston is at top dead center. We want to talk about the ratio of these two volumes. So this is our compression ratio. Our compression ratio could be described as the volume at state one divided by the volume of state two as we go through that isentropic compression. Or we could talk about this as the volume of state four divided by the volume of state three as we go through this isentropic expansion. Notice that V1 is equal to V4 and V3 is equal to V2 and the ratio of the small volume to the big volume can be found by looking at the compression ratio. So in the auto cycle, this isn't how the engine actually works, but this is kind of what it would look like if you were drawing a storyboard. So our first process is isentropic compression. So here, our piston is moving up. Now, we'd have this constant volume heat addition. So in this model, it's like the piston dwells here for whatever time it takes for us to add this heat. And then after we add this heat, the gas wants to expand and that pushes the piston down, creating work. Now, again, the piston sort of would dwell here as we reject heat. Now, this is not physical. This doesn't happen in any engine, but this is kind of conceptually how we're modeling our auto cycle. So here in this last process, we would have heat leaving the system. So if I draw my PV diagram and my TS diagram, as I move from state one to state two, I'm putting work into the system because I'm compressing my working fluid. 
As I move from state two to three, I'm adding heat. This is the unique feature of the auto cycle that we add heat at constant volume. Then as I move to state from state three to state four, I'm doing this power stroke, which generates power or gives work out. And then I have to reject heat as I move from state four to state one. And like all cycles, we can operate this continuously in a loop. So we have two processes where we're transferring heat and two processes where we're interested in work. In both cases, in one case, we're adding heat or work. And in another process, we're removing heat or work. So for all of these processes, I can apply my first law. So this is going to be the first law for closed systems. Remember, we worked on this for the whole first third of the class. Some assumptions that we'll often make are that we're at steady state, that we have a closed system. We couldn't use this equation without a closed system. We would neglect the change in kinetic energy and in potential energy. And then for each process, we typically would assume that there's either heat transfer or work, but not both. We'll also assume that every process that we undergo inside of our engine, we're not generating entropy, or we have ideal or reversible processes for all four of these processes we're doing inside our internal combustion engine. So after I make those assumptions, what I'll find is that if I'm finding work from my power stroke, this is going to be the mass in the cylinder multiplied by U at the beginning of the process, minus u at the end of the process. So this is m times u3 minus u4. This is work out, which I expect to be positive. If I'm rejecting heat, this is now going to be m times u at the end of the process, minus u at the beginning of the process, or m times u1 minus u4. Heat out is negative. For the compression stroke, I have m times u1 minus u2, again, at the beginning minus at the end. This is compression, that's work in, work in is negative. And when we're adding heat, this is again, M times U at the end minus U at the beginning, or M times U3 minus U2. And we know that heat in is positive. So all of these equations come from the first law, and the sign is always taken care of by the hip to win sign convention. Now we have symbolic solutions, and we're left wondering what's the fluid? Now the fluid is an ideal gas. So then I have to decide, is it variable specific heat? In which case I would look on table A22 if I was dealing with air. Or is it constant specific heat where I would have U delta U is equal to CV times delta T? I'll put these equations into a thermal efficiency equation where I have the net work, which in our case is going to be work in plus work out because we recognize that the first law tells us one of these is positive and one of them is negative, we'll divide by the heat in. And if we use our expressions that we've already derived for work out, that's the power stroke, and work in, that's the compression stroke, and the heat addition, then we get U3 minus U4 plus U1 minus U2. We would divide this by U3 minus U2. I can rearrange these terms a little bit if I try to make one term in brackets that looks like the denominator, then I can have 1 minus u4 minus u1 divided by u3 minus u2. And that's what I see here. Thermal efficiency can be net work divided by heat transfer in or the net of the specific work divided by the heat transfer in. And in this case, because the mass is the same in all of my different processes, I don't necessarily need to know what the mass is before I find the thermal efficiency. Right? We know that we can develop this expression, 1 minus u4 minus u1 divided by u3 minus u2. But I can also express this in terms of heat transfers. So I know that my net work is equal to my net heat, so I can express net work as Q in plus Q out, recognizing that Q out would be negative. This, if I divide this, right, Q in over Q in is one. So this is one plus Q out over Q in. And if I put in my expressions that I developed for Q out and Q in, then I get the same expression, one minus U four 
minus u1 divided by u3 minus u2. So this is good because you should get the same answer no matter how you approach the problem. So we can use net work at the top or we can use net heat at the top and either way we'll get the same expression. So we can move between states by using the ideal gas law. So we can isolate for the specific gas constant or for mass times the specific gas constant because both R and M remain constant throughout the whole cycle given the assumptions that we've made. And if we do that, we'll see that P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. So this is true if I use specific volumes, but it's also true if I use volumes because if I put if I substitute big V for little v here, then all I'm doing is I'm making the constant in the middle equal to m times r. And both of those terms are constant. So if I'm moving between states, I like to use this version of the ideal gas law because I think it's a little easier to deal with the units because I try to isolate, like if I was trying to isolate for T2, I would have T2 is equal to T1 times a ratio of pressures times a ratio of volumes. And if I keep the pressure units and the volume units the same, then they'll become dimensionless ratios. I have to look for the isentropic processes when I'm solving any cycle that uses air as the idea, as the working fluid. It's because these isentropic processes are really the key to solving these processes because I have specific relationships for isentropic processes with ideal gases. So if I have an isentropic process with an ideal gas, like I would with the compression or power strokes. If I'm constant specific heat, I know I can pick from these equations with K in the exponent. And if I'm variable specific heat, I know that the ratio of pressures in an isentropic process is equal to the ratio of the reduced pressures. Or maybe more usefully for these internal combustion engines, the ratio of the reduced volumes is equal to the ratio of the volumes. And these volume ratios are described for us by the compression ratio of the engine. So typically, when I'm talking about internal combustion engines, I'll be looking for equations where I have ratios of volumes, like this one with K in the exponent, if my specific heat is constant, or this one if I have variable specific heat and I need to look up VR on my table, A22, in the textbook. So VR and PR are available on table A22 if you're using air or A22E if you're using imperial units. So the air standard auto cycle, we know we have these four reversible processes. We also know that in a TS diagram, the area inside my cycle is the net heat. And on a PV diagram, the area inside the cycle is the net work. I also know that the net work is equal to the net heat. Now this is kind of an interesting trick because I can see if I make my cycle area bigger, then I'm getting more power. So if I was trying to make um, maybe a Bugatti or something, I would probably want to have as much power as I can inside my cycle. So I would do things to increase the area inside my cycle. So even though this model isn't perfect, right? We've made a lot of assumptions here to get us away from the real world. I can still see that there are ways to increase things like net power. In particular, if I increase my compression ratio, so if I had a cycle that went from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 on a TS diagram, now if I increase my compression ratio, I'm going to go not from 1 to 2, but from 1 to 2 prime, and then to 3 prime, and then back down to 4. I can look at these two cases, and it's pretty easy to see that in the case where I'm increasing my compression ratio, where I go to 2 prime instead of 2, then the area inside my cycle gets bigger. And if the area gets bigger, then my net heat on a TS diagram gets bigger. But since net heat is equal to net work, this also means my internal combustion engine will produce more work per cycle, which all else being equal in terms of things like the engine speeds means that I should get more power as well. So increasing R, the compression ratio, increases the net work. So now that we've sort of been introduced to this idea of auto cycles, I think it's useful to go through and do an example. So here's an example of an auto cycle. So I was nice in this example sheet 
in that I gave you the PV diagram, right, and the TS diagram. On an exam, you'll probably be asked to draw at least one of these and potentially both. We're also given CV, which is 0.171 BTU per pound mass degree Rankine, so this is an imperial problem, and CP, 0.24 BTU per pound mass degree Rankine. If I need to find K, it's going to be CP divided by CV, because K is always bigger than 1, usually approximately 1.4 for air. We're also told that the specific gas constant for air is 0 0.069 BTU per pound mass degree Rankine. We're also given some information here in our state table. We're told that the working fluid is air. We're given the temperature and the pressure at state one. We're given the compression ratio, so V1 divided by V2. We're told the temperature at state three, and we're told the volume at state four in cubic feet. So hopefully this is enough information to solve the problem. But how do I know? Right? We're asked here to find, I think, the net power that's generated from this internal combustion engine. So we've done our first law analysis on all of these different processes. We know that we'll make these assumptions that are written here. And when we do that, we'll get equations for the work in, the work out, the heat in, and the heat out. Now, I also know that for cycles where air is the working fluid, it's very important to recognize which of these processes are isentropic because I can only use those isentropic relationships, either ratios of VRs or something with K in the exponent, if the process is isentropic. So I've circled these in red here on this slide. So here I know that the power stroke is isentropic because it's adiabatic and ideal. I know the same about the compression stroke. So I can use those special isentropic relationships only when I'm finding work and not when I'm adding or removing heat. I know that my air can be either variable specific heat or constant specific heat and I have strategies for approaching both of those two cases. So let's go through the problem. First I want to find the net work. The net work is going to be the work in the, com in the power stroke plus the work in the compression stroke. And I'll let the first law deal with the signs. So here the mass is constant, right? So it's the mass multiplied by U1 minus U2 plus U3 minus U4. I know the mass is in pounds mass. I'm going to look up U on a table, at least potentially. If I did, I would get BTU per pounds mass. So if I multiplied those two things together, I would get work in BTU. But if I want power, now I have to change that work, which is really work per cycle, into power, which is going to be BTU per minute in this case. So here, I now take this power, this energy per cycle, and I multiply it by the RPM of the engine. And then I got to remember that this is a four-stroke engine, so every cycle takes two rotations. So if I do that, I will get a power of BTU per minute, which I may want to then change into horsepower. If I want to take horsepower, then I would take the same equation and I would multiply by 1 divided by 42.2 horsepower per BTU per minute. So I had to get to BTU per minute first because if I was doing this on an exam, our equation sheet tells us this conversion rate for horsepower to BTU per minute. So now I'd like to get an answer, right? I don't know this network. I don't know the mass. I don't know the change or either of these specific internal energies for either of my two processes. I don't know the network, which comes down into this equation. I was given the RPM, right? The rotational speed of the engine. So that's good. And I know this conversion, right? So if I could find the mass and... I could determine my specific internal energies, then maybe I could figure out how to find the power generated by this engine. So how do I find the mass? In order to find a mass, I would like to have an equation that has mass in it. Since my working fluid is an ideal gas, I'll check with the ideal gas law. Remember, there are two different versions of the ideal gas law that I can use. One, when I'm bouncing between states, 
and one if I'm at one particular state. But the mass only shows up if I do this at one particular state. So I know that PV is equal to M times the specific gas constant R times T, which I know has to be an absolute temperature. So if I wanted the mass, if I knew a state that where I knew PV, R, and T, then I could get the mass. Right? So here I know that V4 is equal to V1. I also know that V2 is equal to V3, which is also one-tenth of V4. So I can use this information, and I see that at state 1, I know a lot of this information. So I know P, I know V, and I know R, and I know T. Although I have to cheat a little bit to get V1, because I have to make use of the fact that really the problem gave me V4, but because I know that this uh, heat transfer process happens at constant volume, I know V1 must also be at constant volume. This is why it's good to know how to draw the PV diagrams for these cycles. I know all of this information, I can put it into my calculator, and I see that I get 0 0.0015 pounds mass. So that's good, I have the mass. So now I go back to this equation where I was trying to find the power, and I see that I have the mass. So now if I could fix all the states, then I would get the net work. I could put the net work into this equation for power, and I would get the power. So now we're at the point in the problem where we have a symbolic solution, and we need to start fixing states. So because this is an ideal gas problem, I have to decide if I'm going to do this with a variable specific heat or with constant specific heat. In this video, I'm going to do this both ways, and hopefully we'll have time to do it both ways in the live lecture as well. But if not, you can always come back and check this video. So here, we will first look at variable specific heat, which is an air standard analysis. So I usually like to start on the row of the table where I have the most information. In this case, that's state 1, where I know the temperature and the pressure. And I actually know the volume too, because V1 is equal to V4. So here, because I know the temperature, what I can do is I can go right to table A22, A22E in this case, because it's imperial, right? And I can look on the row, where's 520 degrees, what's U? The other piece of information that I want to pick up off this table is what's VR, because I know that I'm going to have to use isentropic relationships when I go through my cycle. So here, the first state is not too bad, because if I know temperature, that's all I need to know for table A22. Typically, for an internal combustion engine, when I'm fixing a state, I'm either going to know temperature, find specific internal energy, and the reduced volume, or I'm going to know the reduced volume, find the specific internal energy, and then find the temperature. So let's see what to do next. We started at state 1. Let's go to state 2. So I know as I move from state 1 to state 2, I'm going through an isentropic process. So here, I know that this is isentropic. And because I know that this process, remember I circled it in red, I know that when I do this, I can use an isentropic relationship. And Professor Schertzer told me that the isentropic relationships are always the key when you're trying to figure out what's going on in these cycles that use air as a working fluid. So now I know that V1 over V2 is 10, or that V2 over V1 is 1 over 10. Now, because I'm using an air standard analysis with variable specific heat, I can't use those equations that have K in the exponent. That, because K assumes constant specific heat, because remember K is CP divided by CV. So instead, I have to use this ratio of reduced volumes. But that's okay, because I know the, the actual ratio of the volumes. So if I'm trying to find VR2, it's going to be VR1 divided by 10. I've looked up VR1. This is the point where you would go back and do this if you didn't do it automatically from state 1. So I know that VR1 is 1... 158.58 so then vr2 must be that divided by 10 which is just about 15.85 now i can interpolate again right so now i can go back to table a22 and this time i don't know temperature but i do know vr and on that table i only need one piece of information 
So I use this interpolation. I'm kind of color coding which pieces I'm getting from which information, right? So now I can interpolate to find the temperature, which is 1,269.2. And I can find the specific internal energy, which is 222. So this makes sense, right? I could have messed up the compression ratio and, and flipped it over. But what we know, this is the compression stroke. So as we compress the working fluid, the temperature should go up and so should the specific internal energy. And that's exactly what we're seeing. But we're not quite done with state two because I also want to know the pressure here. And this is something that would become apparent if we kept moving on in the problem. But now I'm gonna go from state one to state two and I'm gonna use the ideal gas law to get the pressure. I could do this finding the pressure all at state one, but again, I like to use this equation if I'm moving between states because then I can see that P2 is going to be equal to P1 times the volume ratio times the temperature ratio. And if I keep these units correct and the same and these units the same, then I know just that my output pressure is going to be the same as my input pressure. So I can do this and I see that the pressure here has increased to 358.8 PSI. So that makes sense, right? This is the compression stroke. The whole purpose of this particular process is to increase the pressure, right? It's a compression process. So our pressure goes up and that's exactly what we see. Now we're going to go to state three and this is why we needed to, to find the pressure, right? So as I move from state two to state three, now this is a heat transfer process, right? So here we're adding heat. That means that we can't use that isentropic relationship. So here we have to use just the ideal gas law. That's the only other option we have when our working fluid is an ideal gas. So now I'm going to use the ideal gas law from state two to state three. And this is why we had to go back and find the pressure at state two, because if we didn't do that, then when I got to this equation, I wouldn't know T3 and I wouldn't know P2. So I'd have one equation with two unknowns and I can't really solve that, right? So now that I know P2, I can isolate for T3, which is going to be T2 times a ratio of volumes multiplied by a ratio of pressures. But what happens to the volume as I go from state two to state three? It's constant, right? So because this volume is constant, now as we move through this process, we're really only multiplying by the pressure ratio. And now we get that the temperature here at state three is 3,820. Now I'm not quite done because I need to be able to move between state three and state four. So now I have this temperature. I want to find the specific internal energy. So I'm going to interpolate using table A22. I look for 3820 or something close to it on the table. And I see that the specific internal energy is 772.24. But I'm also, again, going to pick off VR, which in this case is 0.52. You'll notice that I can't use the volume ratios here because this was not an isentropic process. VR, the reduced volume, doesn't stay the same, even though the actual volume stays the same, because this process has heat transfer. It's not isentropic. Now I've got to go to state four. But as I move between state three and state four, I recognize that this is an isentropic process. And for isentropic processes, I can use my ratio of specific volumes or volumes is equal to the ratio of those reduced volumes. So again, I know that my compression ratio is 10, but now V4 divided by V3 is 10. So in order to do this, I had to know that V3 was the same as V2, right? So I can use this to isolate for VR4, which is going to be 10 times VR3. VR4 is going to be 5.22. Now I can go back to table A22 and I can interpolate to find the specific internal energy and the temperature. If I wanted to, I can use the ideal gas law to find the pressure here. But if I think about the equation that I'm trying to solve, all I needed was U1 through 4. So I don't have to find this pressure here at state 4 if I don't want to, unless the problem specifically asks for it. So now I needed this expression for net work. 
I have the mass, and I have all the specific internal energies, so I can put all of that into my calculator, and I find that the net work is 0.4472 BTU. But the problem actually asked me for the power generated by the engine. So I have to take this net work, recognize that this is a four-stroke engine, so I have to take the RPM and divide by two to get the number of cycles per minute, and that would give me an answer in BTU per minute, but what I really want here is horsepower, so I have to divide by 42.4 to get horsepower. I put all these numbers into my calculator, and I find that I that the horsepower from the engine, if I assume that I have an air standard analysis with variable specific heat, is 10.5 horsepower. So that's how I do the problem if I was doing an air standard analysis. But what if I wanted to assume, or if the problem told me to assume, that the specific heats here were constant? This problem sheet actually gave us a con uh, values for specific heats, right, CP and CV, so I could use a cold air standard analysis here. Then my delta U terms are not going to be delta U's at all, but they'll be replaced with CV times delta T. This is true at U1 minus U2 and at U3 minus U4. So here we'll use different equations to solve the problem. We won't ever care what the specific internal energy is. Instead, all we need are the temperatures. But we're going to use the same general process. We're going to go through the states in the same order, and we're going to still recognize which one of these processes are isentropic. So first, I see as I go from state 1 to state 2 that this is an isentropic process. Notice that I didn't even have to find U1 or VR1 because now when I assume that it's constant specific heat, those two columns I don't care about. I'm never going to use that information, so I don't have to find it. So now if I go and assume that this is a constant specific heat process, then I want to find the right equation with K in the exponent. So this is isentropic. So I know my volume ratio. So I try to find a ratio of temperatures as a function of a ratio of volumes with K in the exponent. I know that V1 divided by V2 is equal to 10. So here I can find T2 is equal to 1,336.6 degrees Rankin. Now if the problem told me the temperatures in Fahrenheit at the beginning, I'd have to really remember to go to Rankin degrees. This is true in this problem and if we were doing air standard analysis. So remember, we always want absolute temperatures here. So even though I don't have to find U and VR, I still have to find the pressures here. So I'm going to use the ideal gas law between state 2 and state 1, just like I did before, to find that the pressure at state 2 is 377.8. So again, this is our compression stroke. We're supposed to be increasing temperature and pressure. So I feel pretty good about this, that I didn't mix up how to use my compression ratio. Now I'm going to move between state 2 and state 3. Remember, this process is not isentropic because here we're adding heat. Instead, the only thing I can do here is use the ideal gas law. So here I'm trying to find T3 which if I manipulate the ideal gas law between two states, I see that this is T2 times the ratio of volumes, which in this case I know this is 1, because we have in an auto cycle heat added at constant volume, and P3 divided by P2 I also know. So now I can use this information to find the temperature at state 3. And remember, I don't need the specific internal energy because my first law equations, my symbolic solutions, are all going to be CV times delta T. So I don't care what the internal energies are. I'm never going to find them. Again, I'm going to look at the process from state 3 to state 4, recognize that it's isentropic, and look for an expression that has volume ratios and K in the exponent. I use this equation to find the final temperature at state 4, as 1,486.5 degrees Rankin. So now I have all the temperature information that I need. My net work equation has changed from M times delta U's to M times CV times delta T's. But now I know CV because it's given in the problem, and I've figured out all of these temperatures by going through the states. I put this into my equation, and I get that the net work is 1,436.5 
0.389 BTU now I go to my equation for power right remember I still have to divide multiply by n divided by 2 because this is a four stroke engine and I want to convert to horsepower so I put these numbers into my calculator and again I get a value for horsepower but here it's 9.2 horsepower this is different remember before it was 10.5 horsepower and I think this kind of illustrates that we pay a price when we make another assumption so here our assumption of a cold air standard analysis or constant specific heat is you know brings us further away from reality so I trust the previous number a little bit more than I trust this number but even to get to that previous number I had to make a whole bunch of assumptions so really we're using this to get some idea of what the horsepower is and if we were comparing two engines I would have a good idea of maybe how to increase this horsepower or which of those two engines would have more power but I'm not all that confident that if I made this engine and ran it I would get this exact value for horsepower this is a model and it'll give me some idea of what the right value is so that's the end of this lecture next class we'll look at diesel cycles and what happens when we assume that the heat addition process happens at constant pressure instead of constant volume see you next time